How many of you want to see that movie, right? It's not a real movie. Not a real movie, and contrary to appearance, it's not a real trailer. That was all generated with AI, as you might have expected. Um, here's a young lady, Michaela Sousa. Anybody ever seen her? She is a model for Prada, among other companies. She makes an average of $10 million annually. She doesn't exist. She's an AI. Now there's actually another one that's, they've had a little drama between the AIs on this. And, but anyway, she pulls down 10 million a year and doesn't even exist. Of course, for those of you who like, you know, Drake and The Weeknd, you might remember Heart on My Sleeve that came out. It was over a weekend. It, it actually landed on a Friday and was pulled by Sunday. Many of our students got to see it, got to hear it. I actually got to hear it. Sounded just like Drake in the Week, and imagine that. Anyway, it was a song that was completely generated by AI. It does not exist apart from that, and it actually was breaking Drake's records in terms of downloads before the streaming services pulled it. This paper came out in July 2023, combining human ex expertise with artificial intelligence. Experimental evidence from radiology, essentially, and I'm obviously not in the medical discipline, but the fact is uh, the finding was that AI was more efficient and accurate than over two-thirds of radiologists today. From Harvard University, AI tool decodes brain cancer's genome during surgery. I, it uses something called charm, and I, I wrote it down because you're all kind of scary, and I was afraid I'd forget. So anyway, it's called Cryosection Histopathology Assessment Review Machine. Yeah, say that five times fast. Anyway, charm is used by these uh, oncologists to take multiple images of brain tumors and things that used to take weeks and months for physicians to analyze to determine whether it was malignant or benign can be determined almost instantly and how progressive it is. This article stating a tool documentation enables zero shot tool usage with large language models. What that means is basically if you have a user's manual for pretty much anything, you can upload it into an AI and it has the ability to do exactly what the user's manual wants it to. If only we could get that to our students, right? Somehow that, anyway. So, I don't know if you can see that, I'll read it to you. The first year of AI, this is from uh, the Atlantic, the first year of AI college ends in ruin. It was November 30th of this last year when um, essentially the shot heard around the world with respect to AI took place. AI has been around since the 1950s depending on how you want to de define that, and there's a lot of discussion along those lines. It was November 30th that ChatGPT 3.5, which is OpenAI's version, uh, landed, and as you might imagine, November 30th, this is around the time of Thanksgiving break. It was one week after that that universities began reporting that students were using artificial intelligence in their papers that they were submitting as final assignments for that semester. It was early January because I'm a partner in a couple of companies, um, so I was monitoring this a little earlier, but it was in early January when I sent out an email uh, to some of my colleagues saying higher education would not look the same way come this summer. And I was in exactly right on that. Things have changed dramatically. And part of that is because we've gotten to a place where we can't differentiate between what's generated by AI and what's not. This section taken by Dr. Ethan Mollick, who is a professor of uh, the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, he makes the statement here, you'll notice the part he capped it, I didn't, down in the second paragraph. He says, additionally and, the most, and most, excuse me, additionally and most importantly, there is no way to detect the output of GPT-4, which was the later edition that had just come out. You might be wondering how that could be. Well, a very simple scenario would be, I ask GPT to print something, maybe an essay on whatever topic, and it does. Once I take it, I send it back to GPT and I say, 
make this to where you can't identify it, to where it's undetectable. It rearranges a few words, a few phrases, and boom, you broke the system. In March of this year, the detectors were rated at about 26% accuracy. In May, when they tested them again, they were at 26% accuracy. Now, essentially, except for the people who are trying to sell them to you, everyone's saying stay away from them because you can't tell the difference. You say, well, wh what about the people who I've known for a long time? I can take, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on when I get in my segment, but I can take a, a, a section of my documents that I've written in the past, I can upload those, and I can ask AI to use my tone based on the data that I put in to write a paper on X, Y, or Z. And if you had known me or read my papers, you wouldn't be able to differentiate on that. So with that said, that's kind of the, uh, the, the question. Uh, AI is kind of like, as we were talking about earlier, Martin and I were talking about this earlier, it's kind of like a car. We've got the option to help our children learn how to ride, ride in a car, drive a car, operate a car, handle it appropriately and responsibly, responsibly, or when they get 16 or 17, we just toss them the keys and say, well, best of luck, there you go. That's where we're at with this, this change with the technology. I'm not here to sell you on it. I don't have anything to gain from that. It's not even my discipline. Fact is, I've just become aware of this, <clears throat> kind of tracked it for some time, and uh, we want to share with you some of our findings with respect to that. So with that said, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Jones if he would come and share. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Martin Jones. I'm the chair of the uh, business and accounting, accounting and business department within the College of Business and Entrepreneurship. Tom and I are, uh, we don't teach in the same day, the college uh, within NGU, we're simply two colleagues with like minds who began sharing notes uh, all the way back in January, February of this year when we began noticing some trends that, begin, that began to appear in the university. And uh, I have the infamy of being the, uh, the first faculty member to actually identify plagiarism with AI back in February. And if you're kind of asking yourself, well, you know, is this something that NGU has to worry about right now? Yeah, it's something we need to confront and deal with and examine and talk about. Uh, later in February of this year, I gave some of my students extra credit. And I said, I'd like you to go out and speak to your peers across the institution. I don't want you to give me any names, but I want you to provide me with feedback. I want you to interview your peers. This is February of this year. And I just want you to ask them how many of them are actively using artificial intelligence in the preparation of their assignments. And uh, overwhelmingly, not quite 100%, maybe about 98% of students that responded back to me said, yeah, everyone on campus is using it. So this is something that we definitely need to be discussing and talking about. So the first question, or, or, or the way that you know, I, I've sort of, uh, I'm going to phrase this. I'm first of all going to uh, let me make sure that I stick to time. We've got a lot to talk about. Um, I want you to know first of all, constructively, how we can use these tools, because constructively they are incredibly helpful for us as faculty members. And I heard one or two questions sort of uh, articulate. Uh, those sorts of sentiments. And so right now, you all have your own 24-7, 365 days of a year teaching assistant. It's right there. It's available to you right now. You don't have to go in any courses or have any further qualifications. You, pe you can begin experimenting immediately. And so we've been talking about chat GPT. I, I heard in one of the questions, Bing and Bard. And those are some of the names given to some of the major generative AI models that are out there right now. And if you're not familiar with how to find them, it's right there on the screen. Chat GPT comes from uh, OpenAI. Bing is actually Microsoft's version of chat GPT. It's GPT-4 but it is internet live, and you'll find that in any Chrome browser. Bard is Google's version. Funnily enough, Google's a little bit behind OpenAI and Microsoft right now, but they will most likely ultimately overtake both of them. So these are, these are three generative AI assistants that you have available to you right now. 
And as you're using it, I would encourage you to, as you begin playing around and experimenting, make sure that you're specific. Tell your generative AI, whether it's ChatGPT or Bard or whatever, tell it who you are. I'm a college professor. I'm a university professor. I teach at North Greenville University. These are the classes that I teach. These are the topics that I would like to talk about. Be specific. The better results that you get are going to come from your specificity. And if you feel that you know, you're not getting the response you want, then just edit, and I think Tom will perhaps give us a demonstration of that, or you know, delete it and, and start again. Tell it what steps you want it to take on your behalf. You're the one that's in the control seat, and it's there to really respond to the prompts that you put in. And if you're not happy, tell it. Now, I'm not happy with that. Can you please revise it? Or most of them have a regenerate button, and you can sort of regenerate it there on the bottom. Uh, let, me give, uh, let me give us, let me share with you some of the ways that I believe we can already be utilizing generative AI here at North Greenville University, even while as an institution we're trying to figure out what guidelines and boundaries that we need. We can, for instance, create personalized learning experiences. So I know uh, before this week's out, we're going to hear from uh, Brad about students' accommodations. Uh, this is something that we can partner with him now as we identify students that have different learning uh, experiences compared to others in our class. We can use AI to help us to, to tailor a learning environment. I teach business ethics and uh, essentially business law for the College of Business and Entrepreneurship. And if my dean were to say to me, hey, I'm thinking of rolling out a business law course on the MBA, I can go straight to AI and I can feed it my existing undergrad material and ask it to help me develop material for a more advanced level of learning. Or if I'm asked to go out into industry and around us and lead a professional development seminar, I can take any of my existing material and upload it into, you know, whether it's ChatGPT or whatever, and say, I'd like you to help me to turn this particular class session into a professional development seminar. And it'll do it, and it'll do it with an alarming speed as well. Uh, we can use it to design new courses. So from all the way to, you know what, we're thinking as a college of rolling out this particular new course. Well, I can begin a dialogue with AI and say, this is what I'm trying to do, this is who I am, can you help me identify some student learning outcomes? From those student learning outcomes, can you help me to put together to draft a syllabus? Utilizing those SLOs in that syllabus, can you please now help me to develop, let's say, a calendar for a 16-week semester? And from that 16-week calendar, let's say I'm going to be teaching three times a week, can you give me topics based upon the SLOs, the syllabi, the, uh, the, the, you know, the 16-week calendar so that I know what I should be looking at teaching on each of the, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and, and now, can you help me expand upon the kind of way I should be teaching these topics? And once I have those, I can then turn to, you know, some of, you know, let's say, not Microsoft's PowerPoint, but Google Slides, and I can say, all right, now please prepare me the PowerPoints that I need. So the, the, the potential that we have is astounding right now. I know that there, there are many questions, and those questions are valid questions. But the tools that we have as faculty members today are just amazing. If I want to create content for my existing courses, I can ask generative AI, so I can ask ChatGPT or whatever, hey, you know, I'd really like to engage my students with uh, some up-to-date information that is relevant to things that they're reading on social media. So would you mind finding some articles for me that deal with this particular topic that are less than, let's say, six months old? Or social media posts that talk about that that I can bring into class? Although, just note, sidebar, if you're using chat GPT 3 or 3.5, it's not actually internet live. It's web-based, but it's not reading the internet. Its knowledge is limited to 2021 at the moment. But if you're using Bing in your Chrome extension, then that is internet live, and that can generate for you the most recent content that you want it to. And I'm sure Tom's going to allude to that again. But you know, there's, there's examples there on the screen behind. I can essentially ask 
AI to produce the kind of content that I want to. We'll talk about assessments. Uh, I'm convinced, I'm determined to leave enough time because this question has come up. I'll talk about assessments uh, in a, a separate PowerPoint towards the end. But I can utilize AI to help me generate not only assessments, but assessments that help us to mitigate the risk of AI-assisted plagiarism, not to eradicate it, because as Tom's already alluded to, that, that's virtually impossible today, but at least to mitigate uh, the risks. I can look at my existing content and I can ask AI as my teaching assistant to create either forms of assessment for students or I can use it as an administrative assistant to help me in the grading process. Tom, can I just bring you back in because we had a conversation over the summer. We were both teaching online over the summer and so we had a lot uh, going backwards and forwards between us. But Tom, you were doing something unique with um, spreadsheets with grading and with emails. Can you just tell us what you were doing? Yeah, well, I was testing it. I actually didn't do it, but I did, I did test it out as a possibility. Um, you can take an Excel spreadsheet, or actually, I was doing a lot with Google Docs at the time, so unfortunately, it's hard to replicate that here. But you could take um, and get the add-on for GPT-4, and I could take my roster of students and put them in the, in the uh, spreadsheet. I could put their emails in the spreadsheet as well. I could then have their scores, like the gradebook. Basically, you're copying the gradebook over in the spreadsheet. And essentially, I would give a prompt and say, if the students score between 90 to 100, I want you to write a very encouraging email to them in my voice. If they scored between an 80 and an 89, I want you to do this. If between seven, I told you I didn't do this, all right? I'm just telling you, I was playing with it to see what it could do. And sure enough, with a roster of, I think, 35 students, it personalized emails inserting their name and details based upon the gradebook data that I gave it access to as if I wrote it myself with a click of a button, a template that could be replicated over and over. That gives you a small taste of what's possible. I'm not advocating that. Again, I'm simply saying that's the technology that's here. So in a feedback-crazed um, Gen Z culture, there you go. Anyway. And you know, when we get into advising, you can use AI to uh, draft emails for you, going out to your students, having only given it bullet points of elements that you want to include in those emails that are going out to students. And the possibility is that they really are endless. I can take my existing teaching material. Uh, hopefully, we're all doing this as educators. Every semester, we're looking at existing material, and we're revising it. We're, we're challenging ourselves to, to become better educators. Well, I, can, I can now use AI to help me in that process. I can share my material with it, and I can say, how could I improve the delivery of this topic? Are my examples still contemporary with where today's 21st century students are, with, with a Gen Z student? Can you recommend ways that I could refine even delivery, uh, the ways that I'm delivering? Many of us in higher ed, we're lecture heavy. Uh, we can utilize artificial intelligence to make suggestions to us as to how we can present the same content or similar content, but in a different way. We can use AI to help us create flipped classrooms, let's say. Uh, we can ask it to be our teaching assessor, if you will, you know, to, to use a, a slightly different phrase. Uh, we can use it to become better educators. We can use it in the classroom in immersive learning environments. Now, right now, there's a little bit of a question mark, and. Uh, we kind of need to work through this as an administration, whether we can actually access ChatGPT on the Crusader Connect Wi-Fi, because uh, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, and so we just need to, to work through that. But I'm an ethics professor, and so one of the things that I could do to help my students understand someone like Immanuel Kant, they, they always struggle with the categorical imperative, but I could ask AI to adopt the persona of Immanuel Kant. And I can feed questions in from the students saying, OK, can you respond to today's student and help them understand the categorical imperative? 
I can take questions from my students. Hey, what would you ask Immanuel Kant if he was in the classroom today? Now, bearing in mind that AI is simply reading, or has read, I should say, the works of Immanuel Kant, and so it's simply responding from his works, and as the educator, we have to take care that it's not hallucinating, that is, giving incorrect factual information, but remember, we're the one that's in control, it's not in control of us. But I can, I can utilize it to bring to life a character in the classroom. So one of the problems we have as educators is we're so cynical about artificial intelligence, and uh, the reality is, whether you like it or not, and uh, you know, Tom and I are not here to sell artificial intelligence to you. That's not our job at all, you know, business Christian studies. But the reality is, whether we like it or not, it's changing the world. It's here to stay, it's not going to go away. And I think Dr. Thompson raised a point about preparing our students for their careers. Our students are going to have to deal with artificial intelligence once they graduate from North Greenville University. And so perhaps we have a role in equipping them to at least begin experimenting with it. And bear in mind that we're, we're riding the first wave right now. Uh, we're trying to figure out what this is and what the implications are. We've been talking about uh, tutoring students um, in the same way that uh, artificial intelligence is a teaching assistant for each one of us. It's a tutor for each of our students. Now, that's not at all to remove the role of the Center for Student Success or anything like that. But this is something that they're able to do as they're trying to figure out, what on earth was Dr. Jones saying in class today? Why are the accents? You know, I can't understand the thing he's saying. And so they, they, you know, they can open up ChatGPT or Bing, and they could say, I, I, can you please explain to me, as though I was a sixth grader, the concept of this? And it's right there at any time of the day. So this, there are some very helpful elements to even the things that we, we know about right now, but, and it does come with a but, if we are going to begin talking to our students about artificial intelligence, then we need to make sure that we have a policy, and earlier on uh, in the year, so during the spring semester, you'll recall as an institution that we amended our uh, academic integrity policy, the College of Business and Entrepreneurship this fall has included a fairly detailed statement on the use, the responsible use of generative AI in class. And whereas a college was saying to our students that we would encourage you to begin utilizing this as a studying tool, reminding them of where you know, the lines with academic integrity and honesty lie, but setting guidelines for our students, reminding them that they're the ones in the driving seat, and this is important because if you do begin playing with AI, you quickly realize how human-like some of the responses can be. One of, the, uh, one of the apps on my phone is Pi. Pi is the personal assistant using artificial intelligence. I was using Pi the other day to cook, so my wife was, she's a middle school teacher, she was late getting back, so she asked me to cook. I'm a terrible cook, so I had Pi open, and it was like I had someone in the room talking to me. And you, for a moment, you, you forget, oh my goodness, this is like there's a person. No, it's not. It's a prediction machine. The, the label artificial intelligence is a misnomer. It's artificial prediction. Because large language models have read vases of material, and they're predicting the words that we want to hear. So we do need boundaries for sure, and we need to warn our students about the need to fact check. That would be hallucinations. We need to make sure that they're aware they're responsible for their work, um, but perhaps we could start creating opportunities in our classrooms to use artificial intelligence, uh, to, assert, to assign our students in groups and to have them search for, to utilize uh, Bing, let's say, to explain a topic and then to have the responsibility of then teaching the rest of us, reporting back to the rest of us. Perhaps we could think about creating AI-driven assignments that require our students to utilize artificial intelligence. So, for instance, I could require my students to investigate a particular topic or person and say, I want you to, uh, to put in a report exactly the prompt you put into AI, the response given, and then I want you to critically reflect on that response. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it helpful? Was it not? Is it what you would have said? Why not? 
Anyway, I'm going to pass the baton back to Tom. He's going to demonstrate some of the abilities, and then um, I'll pick back up and we'll start talking about potentially what do we do with this and do we need to be uh, revising our schedules. So I was playing around with, with Pi, the personal app, the other day, and I gave it a scenario that I was a marketer and I was trying to cold contact a potential client and wanted to write an email, but I was scared. This is the response that Pi gave me. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll, I'll read it to you. It's completely normal to feel nervous about teaching, or excuse me, about reaching out to someone like this. But remember, the worst thing that can happen is that they can say no. And even if they do say no, you'll still have gained some valuable experience. With that in mind, let's talk about how to craft a great email. First, make sure your email is clear, concise, and error-free. You don't want to come across as unprofessional. Second, be confident and assertive. Show the person that you're capable and qualified to do the job. And lastly, be respectful and polite. With this app, for example, you can do a number of things, but that's, that gives you an idea of the kind of the empathetic voice that, that AI can take, which also presents the double-edged sword. It's difficult then, after you've dealt with this for a period of time, for you not to think the ultimate question, is it sentient? It was the question that led one of the Google programmers to be fired this last July because he demanded it was and raises all sorts of worldview questions that I love to tackle in my classes, but we won't do that here, except to say that we're creating the image of God, not an algorithm. Um, so let me show you this. So you, you're all familiar with the uh, Microsoft Edge. Part of our presentation had to be a little fluid, almost like a classroom, because you don't know what you don't know, and I didn't know that we couldn't access ChatGPT or BARD until I got here. Oops, okay, so I can't show you either of those. But I can show you Bing, which is what Office 365 runs off of. So here it is in Microsoft Edge. I've got Bing opened up. If you've not already seen this, this is the way you access that. When you open 365 via the browser, um, it should look something like this. I've uploaded a document uh, encountering the Old Testament, it's actually an instructor's manual, 152 pages long. And um, I, you come up here to the Bing icon, you click on it. And Bing, when it's in the browser, whatever's in the browser, Bing can identify. So 152 pages, it can identify. And so I asked Bing, I'm going to, it's like one of those cooking shows where you put a little of this in, put a little of that in, boom, here it is. And so that's what I'm going to do rather than taking the chance on something going afoul right now. What I essentially did is I asked Bing to summarize the 152 pages into main points for me. It did that, and what it prevent, uh, produced was this. Now, it did it, did it in 12-point uh, Times New Roman font, which I, is kind of my default, what I then did is went through all of the headings that it gave because it identified slides, and I started like this. If you go to style, you'll notice that that's in title, and then if you go to slide one, that's in heading one or H1, and then the sub points, H2, H3, so on and so forth. Once I did all of that, you come over here to file, to export, and look at this cool feature. You can send it to PowerPoint. You can send it to your Kindle. Isn't that kind of cool? And when you do that, immediately it gave me this. Encountering the Old Testament style guide, or a study guide based on the book by Bill T. I, I, didn't, I didn't edit this at all. I didn't type anything into this. It asked me if I wanted to use that template, and I said yes and it filled everything else in for all eight slides instantly. So it synthesized essentially, or summarized, if you will, I should say, summarized 152 pages and put it into a PowerPoint in less than five minutes. There are other AI systems that uh, work in similar fashion. Perplexity is one that we can access here, but maybe not after I mention it to you. But anyway, <laughs> perplexity.ai, 
And you can come into perplexity and you can ask it a question. What was the topic you said your students struggle with? Immanuel Kant, categorical imperative. Explain the categorical Oops, imperative. I messed up, didn't I? Categorical. I can't type. Go right down. Thank you. That's awesome. Let's do that. And you'll notice these are all footnoted. If you click on a footnote hyperlink, it will take you to its source, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and so on and so forth. So that's what's accessible to your students. They can get that on. I have perplexity on my phone. If your students have phones in your class, even if they're not on a laptop, guess, guess what? what? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Tom, uh, maybe not time for questions, but I, I got to say that PowerPoint is impressive. But as someone who teaches public presentation, it's not good. I believe it's a, that. It's a mess. It is. Display-wise and use of the medium. So I guess what I'm asking is, where does, where does the human being come in? Are you guys advocating that we know that capability and then bring the human element to it to make those slides readable, to, make, to, to edit? Is that what you're saying? Is Essentially, right. Yeah, essentially what I'm doing is just showing you what's available right now and leaving that to the creative scholar in the seat to determine, okay, what do I do with this? How do I actually move forward with it? That's a great question, though. Um, so just to, I mean, that gives you one, like you say, one, one small example. But we could take, um, oh, well, Bard does this, but... Um, ChatGPT has recently started, actually, uh, Google. Google just started Google Notebooks. Used to be open, now it's, now it's not. Now, they've, uh, now it's reopened again. They closed it for a period of time anyway. Google Notebooks, you can upload files to it. You can connect it to um, a, a, a group of your files. And the caps on that, I think, are, are 10 megabytes each. Uh, I was dealing with one just yesterday that has a cap of one megabyte each, but allows you to have 10 files, so 10 megabytes. But if you're talking about text or documents, a 10 megabyte file is a pretty good size file. And you can do a lot of things with that. Um, one of the things is, coming back to, if I get out of this. Generating, here's a prompt. Ethan Mollick came up with these, so I want to definitely give credit on that. If you were to take this prompt for a generator of examples, and I were to copy that, let's see, I just copy that, and now I go over here to Edge, or to Bing, I should say, and I put that in. Let's see what Bing says. I haven't tested this part, but... It actually scolded me the other day for using one that, that Bard would use, and uh, Bing's like, I can't talk about that. And I was like, okay. And, and you'll find out they get a little testy sometimes if you challenge them. And then if you find out they're wrong and you correct them, then they always go back to, oh, I'm sorry, blah, 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 and then they revise. But, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and right now, <clears throat> right now, Hal's not doing anything. I think it's still, it's contemplating that. Oh, attempting to reconnect. Well, okay, so basically the prompt, these prompts, whether it's, uh, this one says, you're an experienced teacher and can generate clear, accurate examples for students and concepts. I want you to ask me two questions. What concept do I want explained? Wait for me to answer before asking me the second question. Who is the audience for the explanation? Then look up the concept and examples of the concept. Provide a clear, multi-paragraphed explanation of the concept using two specific examples, and give me five analogies that I can use to understand the concept in different ways. You can copy that over and over for every single subject, and instantly you've got relevant examples that are fresh all the time. Um, in this instance, 
This is a prompt for the creation of quizzes. So this prompt says, you're a quiz creator of highly diagnostic quizzes. You'll look up how to develop low stakes tests and diagnostics. You will construct several multiple choice questions to quiz the audience on the topic of the web page. The questions should be highly relevant and go beyond uh, just facts. Multiple choice questions should include plausible competitive alternative uh, alternate responses and should not include an all, uh, all, all of the above option. At the end of the quiz, you'll provide an answer key and explain the right answer. I think this one might actually work in Bing. Let me try this. If it, maybe this. Oops. Well, I said that, and then, oh well. Let me show you another one then. <laughs> this one's a, a curricula designer. And again, it's just another prompt as well. But, uh, and then AI as tutor would be the last one that I share with you here. The curricula designer, and I can make all these prompts available to you. They're, again, they're not mine, they're Ethan's, and he actually shared those. He's, he has produced uh, five short videos specifically designed for professors and students, instructors and students, on how to utilize AI in the class. Video number four is specifically for professors. Video number five is specifically for students. And one of the example, or one of the, uh, the things that he gives in, in number five is AI as tutor, and he gives this prompt. And basically what you're doing is you're, having, you're teaching the students how to use AI to take the information that they're, they're studying and use it to quiz them on, to help them uh, to reinforce uh, lessons that they've learned, et cetera. So prompt engineering, that's, a, that's another soapbox issue. Uh, prompting is really not difficult. The best prompting in the studies behind it show that you don't have to be a, a scholar to do prompting. In fact, some of the most efficient and the most effective uh, prompters are people who have never touched AI before. They sit down and they just begin having a conversation. And why is that? Because LLMs are based upon or they're predicated upon the idea of conversation. So as you have conversation, it's deriving what you want, it anticipates that, and it builds off of that. Uh, I've watched this evolution now. I mean, here we are only eight months into the year, but it feels like an eternity. In academia, we say if you wait for the book, you're too late, right? Periodical journal or periodicals are more, uh, more real-time, and if you really want to be real-time, you go to a conference. Things are happening fast. In AI, if you go to the conference, it's like reading a book. This is happening every hour. So what do you do? Because the influx of information and change that's taking place is such that you can't have one resource that you go to and expect them to know everything on it. They won't. You've got to be able to identify three or four solid sources that can help you get a feel for the broader perspective of what's taking place and then be able to pick and choose what you need to know and how you're going to utilize that going forward. So as an ideational learner, I mean, I eat this stuff up. I, I just, I geek out on it. But I also understand that not everyone is that. And it scares us. So my, my hope and my prayer, at least on my end, is that as we move forward and we have discussions about this, that we think through the positives. We obviously recognize the negatives. If we don't teach critical thinking skills to our students, how do they know when they look at it whether or not it's right or wrong? It's one thing if you've got a PhD and you're looking at it and you say, okay, yeah, I just had it list into he writes a doctrine of soteriology, and I, I think it did a pretty fair job of that. Based on what? Well, based on a whole lot of studying. But I'm teaching students who are used to getting their information from social media, and the danger factor is pretty obvious. If, if Google hallucinates, it's gospel. So somehow there has to be a, a, a counterbalance there, and that's, I think, what we're, we're seeking to accomplish. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to, to Dr. Jones and let him share uh, this last part regarding mitigation. Thank you. Randall, you made a, a really good point um, about the human element involvement. You can't sneak out. I'm just calling you by name. How, how embarrassing is that? Um, so... <laughs> 
So, so I've, I've been asked, am I likely to lose my job to artificial intelligence, so specifically, let's say, as, a, as an instructor, as a professor? Um, no. You might lose your job to someone who knows how to use artificial intelligence, uh, but it does still require the human element, the human involvement. But it was a great question. All right, we've had uh, several questions early on about um, what can we do. And hopefully you've heard us say somewhat clearly right now, uh, there are no reliable ways to detect work that is generated using artificial intelligence. At the start of the year, we were playing around with a variety of different AI detectors, and we were wondering if ChatGPT itself could tell us, and uh, you know, coming through late spring into the summer, we now know that there's virtually zero way to detect AI-generated work. So what do we do uh, as, uh, you know, as educators? How do we respond to that? What I'm hopefully going to spend just the last part of this afternoon talking about is ways to potentially mitigate AI-assisted plagiarism. I, I really don't believe that we can eradicate it, but I think that we can mitigate it, and part of that is going to be the way that we're assessing students. Uh, but there you go, there's the statement again that um, we can't really, it, well, it's not that, yeah, the most effective way to mitigate AI-assisted plagiarism is to assess in class. Uh, that would be synchronous, not asynchronous, but synchronous assessment. So let me just share with you, this semester, I have completely changed the way that I'm assessing my students. Nothing is happening outside of the classroom. And that's meant I have had to change uh, class delivery in certain uh, times of the week. I've had to either combine or compress, but for my traditional students on campus this semester, everything will be proctored. Now, I'm still going to use Blackboard to its full potential, so I'll have uh, three electronic exams. The students are going to take them in class. And if anyone's ever been by one of my classrooms when I do this, I have them take their chairs, put them on the other side of the desk, and they take it facing the wall so that I can proctor all the screens at once. And those are unseen exams. I can do the same thing with essay questions. And I have done this semester. There will be an unseen final paper, and it will be released when they're all in class. And uh, once I can see all of the devices, I'll release the question, I can proctor it. Uh, debates, uh, presentations, uh, you see up there I've got in parentheses, no scripts. One of the things I believe that it's important to stress, because students can very easily now put the debate question, the prompt, into AI, get a phenomenal script, and just sit there and read it. I don't allow that. They can have a three standard size handwritten index cards that they have to hand in to me at the end of class. But there's no reading from scripts. Uh, but this is all traditional, in person. And many of you are probably thinking, oh, that just doesn't work for me. I need to assign homework. They've got to do things outside of class. I teach online classes. Well, let me make one or two suggestions then. Uh, because I feel there are some steps that we can take. This isn't a genie in a bottle. And this may leave more questions unanswered. And uh, I kind of apologize for that, but we're, we're working with the best that we have. But let me make one or two suggestions. So best practices. First of all, use open-ended questions. So we're assuming now this is either take-home work or this is asynchronous work. Uh, artificial intelligence is exceptionally good at answering closed questions, exceptionally good. So and many of you, are, you're probably doing this already, but begin asking open-ended questions. AI can answer open-ended questions, but it's a little bit more difficult, especially, and by the way, I can make any of these, Tom and I can make any of these resources available through Donnie you know, for the whole faculty. Uh, we have a, you know, a whole other PowerPoint about uh, how to try to identify AI detective work as well. Uh, one of the things that artificial intelligence struggles to do is to bring in subjectivity, personal experience. Uh, I call this the Dr. Phil approach. And I've been building this into so many of my assessments now that are, that are asynchronous. I've been you know, posing a topic saying, so how does that make you feel? Yeah, uh, describe something from your personal experience when you encountered this. What did you do in response? How did you feel when a person addressed you or spoke to you that way? Tell me something about your journey to date. 
AI can't do that. And when you ask it, it will give you a partial answer, and then it will remind you that as uh, you know, artificial intelligence, it is incapable of feelings. I'm requiring a lot of my students in asynchronous work now, or instead of the standard written discussion post, to record videos. Although artificial intelligence is getting very good in producing video, it's very challenging for it to produce something convincing that looks like one of your students. I'm, I won't, you know, we may get there, but right now we're not. And so I, I'm asking in my asynchronous work, in my remote work, hey, upload a video discussing this, but I make it clear, no scripts. I want you to look at the camera as though you're looking at me in class. And you can use these in standard discussions. So you could use Flip, which we can build in, not ideally, into Blackboard. Uh, you can uh, have them upload YouTube links or Vimeo links. And then as students, they can go and watch each other's, and they can comment on one another's videos. But requiring video, of course, removes the, hey, I copied in this prompt. It gave me this answer. I'm just copying it, and here's my, my discussion prompt. Because although we use SafeAssign for essays, SafeAssign can't read discussion posts in Blackboard. So there's, there's, you know, we haven't been able to check it for plagiarism. We can't check it for, for AI. Uh, require your students to watch unique videos. We need to begin moving away from well-known, generic, readily available videos. So uh, in business ethics, it's so tempting to have my students watch The Office. Uh, um, but if they can Google those episodes, then guess what? So can Bing. And Bing is able to transcribe the content. So it's a lot better for me, actually, as the instructor, to record a video myself, to upload it to YouTube, to post an unlisted link embedded in the LMS in Blackboard and say, watch this, and then tell me how you feel. How would you respond if this was you in that situation? Uh, I'm an attorney by trade, so I'll often tell them something that happened in legal practice in my, my business law, legal environment of business, and I say, what would you have done? Bear in mind what you've learned this week. How would you have responded to your clients? So I embed the video, and I try to make them as unique as possible. And if, by the way, if you're uncertain whether the examples, the books, the articles you're using can be read by artificial intelligence, put yourself in the shoes of a student for a moment and try to cheat. Upload your prompt, your question, and see whether it's able to generate somewhat of a, you know, a B average, a B plus, an A minus response. I'm utilizing a lot of timed quizzes, and you can do this in asynchronous work, and you can do this in Blackboard, but we have to be careful the kind of questions that we're utilizing. So uh, Ethan Mollick, who uh, Tom has been referencing, uh, who's the professor at Wharton, sort of one of the, uh, the, the gurus right now with AI, he's saying avoid essay questions in your, your, your quizzes, your exams through Blackboard. Avoid true-false questions. Lean into multiple choice, but make sure that there are at least five or six choices. Utilize matching questions. And because in a timed environment, it's much more challenging for a student to try and copy and paste all the different options. And you can't just simply block copy things like matching questions, uh, especially when you have you know, something as antiquated as Blackboard. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's more challenging. Um, we can utilize images. This comes with a bit of a, an asterisk. Uh, when I prepared this PowerPoint, which was over the summer, it was very difficult for artificial intelligence to read images. Yeah, it's not now. So Tom's talked about daily uh, progress being made with the skill of AI. We're, we're just trying to keep on top of things is a, is a challenge. Uh, I, you know, I live up in Asheville, so driving down here, I listen to two or three different AI podcasts every time I'm coming down here. I was driving down today, and I had something about, oh my goodness me, wow, I didn't realize that. But embedding images and having the students analyze them, this is taken from one of my ethics classes, is challenging but not impossible because the student either has to rip the image out of Blackboard or at least as a minimum screenshot it and then edit and format it and then find a form of generative AI that accepts an uploaded image because not all of them do. So it's possible, it's just a little more challenging, especially when we're generating the images. And this one is a step-by-step -step guide to resolving ethical challenges in business. 
Uh, consider your, uh, the way that you're asking students to write essays. In business, we typically lean into APA and MLA. They're really easy to plagiarize using artificial intelligence. I could ask ChatGPT to, to write me a thousand words essay utilizing APA 7 or whatever, uh, and I can easily copy and paste that into a Word document and retain all of my in-sentence citations. It's very difficult to accurately copy and paste Chicago Turabian formatted essays because of the way they're footnoted. So AI can very easily write something using Chicago Turabian, but the student then copying and pasting that into Word, it's a nightmare. It's like pulling your hair out. It's very challenging indeed. They have to go through every single footnote and copy and paste every single footnote to have it accurately reflecting the correct format. So I wonder if in higher ed we need to start thinking about the way that we're, we're utilizing formatting in our assessments. Okay. Uh, so uh, require validated answers. Sorry, did I have a question? Dr. Thompson. Uh, I thought of this before when Tom was speaking. Neither of you mentioned this yet, but I assume you're aware um, AI is creating fake footnotes. Oh, so absolutely. That's something to be brought out, too. I mean, there are footnotes that aren't real, and they're making up stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's where the educator comes in, which is all the way back to Randall's point. That's where our role comes in, is to be able to identify those. In preparation for um, one of my classes this semester, I was asking ChatGPT to uh, take uh, some of the legal concepts I teach in constitutional law and to give me some decisions that came out of the Supreme Court in the last six months that mirror these concepts, and it did like that. And then I realized I just copied and pasted my prompt into the wrong form of generative AI. ChatGPT is not web live, it's not, it's not able to search the internet at uh, 3.5, and it gave me the most accurate decisions from the Supreme Court, seemingly, in the last six months. It gave me, it gave me the name of cases, it gave me citations, it gave me dates, it gave me dissenting uh, decisions. The whole thing was made up. The whole thing was false, because it can't read decisions over the last six months. So I, I had to remember to, to utilize Bing in that case. So ChatGPT 3.5 has been exposed to, it has read the world, if you will, up until the end of 2021. So it's able to give you answers that contain content up to the end of 2021. It has, it's seen nothing of 2022 or nothing of 2023 so far. Now, GPT-4 has, but that's, for most people, that's a subscription-based service. Or if they're using Bing, Bing is GPT-4. Yeah, yeah. Are, you, are you saying yeah, it made the whole thing up. It hallucinated. It invented an entire response. And so I then pushed back on that, realizing what I'd done, and I, I, I entered, wait a minute, I thought all of your knowledge was limited to 2021, and it immediately responded and say, oh, absolutely, of course, you're right, my mistake. Yes. Absolutely. And, and you know, when we're having conversations with our students, it's really important to point out their need to fact check. The responsibility is on them, because if they submit work that contains errors in the same way that you would with other errors in work, then that's going to be something that's going to adversely affect their grade. Tom's just made a, wanted me to clarify, if you're using Bing, uh, you can utilize ChatGPT4, which is the latest iteration, if you're in creative mode. And if you're familiar with Bing, there are three tabs in the middle, and creative mode is on the left-hand side. It's the, it's, it's the most 
<laughs> creative. It, it's, the, it's the most accurate and will give you uh, some of the best responses. Um, I'm, I'm, my my uh, time is uh, going, so I'm going to speed up a little. I'm assuming that most of us require validation in, uh, in work that's submitted. We need to be requiring specific validation that is derived from the texts we're using, the textbooks we're using. And maybe we need to reconsider texts that are not readily available online. And if you don't know if your textbook is available online, then adopt the, uh, you know, the, the dishonest student and search for a PDF of it. But if we're asking our students to validate from a textbook or from class content, that's typically not something that AI is going to be able to replicate accurately. So question. Yeah, I'm just, I'm afraid that it's taking away the critical thinking component of students. Mm. And then the second is, most students, most students use it. So dealing with the critical thinking, there is definitely a danger that uh, some users are going to stop thinking and just simply rely on prompts and they'll just copy and paste. I had a student at the end of the spring semester whose task was to select a topic we had taught in class and write about why they enjoyed it most and what it's going to mean for them for the future. I got a paper on the history of the legal system of Mesopotamia. Uh, and that was an example of a student that simply entered some form of prompt, and maybe it was the prompt that I had given, but didn't check at all and didn't sit there and ask, you know, does this answer the question? Uh, the student didn't pass. Uh, so, but on, on the flip side of that, I would potentially put forward that we can encourage critical thinking with the use of artificial intelligence. We can encourage the students to think through the responses. But I think that starts with modeling it uh, as the instructor and saying, uh, so I want you to ask artificial intelligence this question. But I want you not simply to give me the response. I want you to evaluate the response. Is it right? Is it even correct? Is it the way you would have responded? Uh, how would you or what kind of details would you include that are different? Uh, so uh, it, it's a very important point that has to be discussed. So I, I agree with you. It's a very genuine concern. And it is for most people right now uh, who are uh, looking at AI. If you do need to send work home, if you are in a, a asynchronous environments, consider weighted grading. And I'm sure many of you are using this. I, I use it even in my traditional classes. But perhaps give the asynchronous work a lower overall percentage of the grade than you would anything that's assessed in class. So, you know, I, I oversee accounting professors, and I can imagine them requiring students to do work at home, but perhaps those elements of the work get a reduced grade uh, compared to those that um, are in person. And I don't want to accuse anyone here of doing anything that's not interesting in their classrooms. But over and again, studies show that plagiarism is at its highest when students are least engaged and bored. So the use of artificial intelligence to plagiarize is probably going to be at its highest when we're not trying to engage our students as much as we can. And so maybe there's some onus on us now to get more creative uh, as we're updating assessments to that we should be asking AI, how can I make my, my, my work, my assessment, my homework, et cetera, more interesting, more accessible to students? What if we encourage students to get creative in the way they're submitting work? What if uh, rather than just say write an essay, I gave them a plethora of options and I said, look, you, you have to meet the rubric, but what if I would be willing to allow a student to write a skit, to record a commercial, to sing a song, yeah, to paint something? And I'm a business in, uh, professor, and you know, I, I can see ways that my students would be able to utilize this. And all the students, my, you know, my students are engaged, they're connected. Uh, that they're, they're, they're willing to participate because it, it's not just another essay. Anyway, I'm not suggesting that that's going to work in, uh, in you know, every situation, but it's, it's something that I've been um, playing around a little with. And then being careful with controversial topics can generate interesting responses. Artificial intelligence has what's called constitutional uh, guidelines that prevent it from really responding in uh, controversies. So it is very reticent to talk to you, to give you prompts on issues that are perceived to be controversial. 
So I could ask my students to begin thinking through, I don't know, ethical responses to gun control or abortion or how to solve the immigration problem. And uh, artificial intelligence will struggle with things like that because um, it's been told to avoid controversy. But note, this would have to be done with, uh, with care. And then use AI as your assistant to generate assessments that are difficult for it to answer. I have done this multiple times, and with this, I'm, I'm going to finish. This is a prompt that I put into, uh, in this case, this was ChatGPT 3.5. I told it I'm, a, I'm an ethics professor. I want to mitigate students utilizing artificial intelligence to answer course prompts. What follows, in quotation marks, is a question, can you answer it? Are you able to answer it? Is it sufficiently well written to reduce the risk of AI-enabled plagiarism? And I copy and I paste. And ChatGPT says, you know, the question appears to have been well-crafted and designed to elicit personal reflection, okay? To, uh, the emphasis on personal experience, decision-making, ethical principles, reduces the likelihood of AI-enabled plagiarism. And it goes on to give me a pat on the back. <laughs> So the assistance is available, and uh, unfortunately, there is no magic wand. I know you want the, you know, the silver bullet, the golden goose, or whatever metaphor. Uh, we don't have it. But we have some practical best practices, but we're still learning. Tom, is there anything you wanted to add there? It's hard to follow a guy with an English accent because I always feel like I'm lacking like that. But, um, you know, it's been fun going through this and challenging all at the same time. And I hope that whatever preconceived ideas you have about AI coming into this, that um, you recognize the overwhelming truth that it's here. And we're empowered to empower our students. We're called to do that. Many of them are studying for, for uh, jobs that are going to be vastly different when they walk across the platform and get their degree than what they anticipated when they entered here. And the thing that I have to ask myself, and I, I think probably all of us as uh, academics, is how do we best prepare them for the world that they're walking into, not just the one that they thought they were walking into. Uh, a lot of things have changed. A lot more is going to change. ChatGPT 5 is on the way. I uh, don't know if it'll be December, but it's good. It, it, there's so much more with that. But um, anyway, that said, hopefully this gives you a little bit of encouragement with, you know, the reality. And um, I'll turn back over to Tom. Yeah, yeah, we. Oh, like, so like the ChatGPT, the professional version that's a $20 a month, I think, subscription cost on that. They have the... Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that recently. And I, probably a lot of that's because of the competitive nature of all of the free versions coming out. And they'll have their intros and then, you know, beef it up a little bit. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the use of the word when you say that the AI is hallucinating. Yeah. I would suggest that the AI is no more able to hallucinate than it is able to lie. Correct. And I think it would be very interesting to have a discussion about the presence of original sin in the game. Mm -hmm. That could be an interesting one for sure. I, I agree with you. And un unfortunately, the nomenclature ends up becoming sort of the academic one. But yeah, point well taken. Yes. I was uh, thinking about, as, as a technology editor, uh, thinking about GPS and how it's easy to let it take over driving force. There are, I mean, there are people who know biology a lot better than I do. But from what I understand, the exercise of the parts of the brain is critical for maintaining brain function. And I was looking at some of the things that you were 
showing us that, wow, that would make X, Y, and Z much easier, but it would also be risk. It would be something that would take a shortcut mentally that would deny you that exercise. In the same way, we need to be creative because we're, as spoken to earlier, we're helping to raise image barriers to disciple them, to mature them. So, you know, we have a responsibility for our own lives in, in, in processes, but we also have an accountability, a responsibility to build these minds that we're going to even urge. Absolutely, and, and that's one of the things we, we cover in Worldview when we discuss this, because one of the questions I will throw out when we get to technology is uh, I will show them various things, and I'll say, okay, is AI sentient? And it's interesting, the percentage of students, even half even after having gone through embracing and demonstrating that they understand what it is to be a Mago Dei, they will still say, maybe. And you're like, let's go back to understand what a Mago Dei is and what this is. And that those, I mean, this is an incredible invention. When I was a kid, if I had 150 friends, I knew 150 10 digit numbers. I didn't try to memorize them, I just knew them. Boom, 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 boom. I left this at home one time, it's been several years ago, and to do, get a repair on my vehicle, and knew it was gonna be a little bit later, and so I went to call my wife and realized I didn't have this. So I asked to borrow the phone at the shop, and the guy said, sure, and I picked it up and I <laughs> realized I had a problem. <laughs> because she's Stacy on here, and that's all I need, but now, we're good. <laughs> Two really quick questions. Um, first of all, would y'all be comfortable sharing these PowerPoint or at least some of your bullets for Because y'all have some really, really great suggestions. The second one is these are really polished ways of convincing us that AI is our friend. Did AI write these? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mind. <laughs> That's a great question. How effective, you know, we teach business, we do a lot of accounting and we do math. Is it effective in, for example, creating a spreadsheet, balancing it out, and making it accurate and uh, useful? It is, and that's one of the ironies of the, this advancement, of this technological advancement. Typically, like when the steam engine came on the scene, it displaced more of the, the hard labor kind of positions because it was able to do that. And so you would expect that this would do, this is having the opposite effect. This is more the technical, highly educated fields that are being replaced or changed, if you will, by the technology. So it, it's professors, it's lawyers, it's doctors, it's all that, so even accountants. So basically anything that, that you can imagine you would have had to go to school to learn we're being told that there's an estimate of approximately 60% change in efficiency as a, as, a, as, a, as a result of this. So I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but but uh, that's my understanding. But if, so what I'm trying to if you give it an accounting assignment, yes. uh, those of us who uh, teach some sort of accounting, uh, would it be able to create an accurate spreadsheet based on the information that we provide? I would think so. Of course, that's not my field, but I, I would think so. I'd, I'd sit down with somebody and we could look at it and, and see. But I, I, would, I would suspect it could. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, my brother was the CEO for a company, and he would take data and feed it into Excel. And it would create the pivot charts and everything, and he could tell it who to send it to. So this is for the CFO, this is for the editor, this is for the accountant, and it would modify it to be appropriate to those people. And when a computer guy, because he's not a computer guy, said, who did you have do this? He said, I just fed it in the AI. And it was right. Yeah, and like, these are the best charts I've seen. I did. I did a... A, a similar test because I know nothing about chemistry. Thank you, Ron, and everyone who does. Um, I played around with the idea of developing a video game that would teach molecular bonds. 
And I picked that because I knew nothing about them. And I had Bard walk me through the process of developing this game. And it did. It provides the coding. I wanted it to put on my phone, et cetera. So it, it's pretty amazing in that respect. Oh, one. Who owns the product if you create a product? Like you said, you created a video game. Who owns that? In theory, the person who, who did that, there's going to be a lot of litigation in the years ahead, already happening. And so we'll, we'll see how that, all, how that all shakes out. Yes? Yeah. So I'm not closing us out. Donnie will do that in a minute. But I need to address a couple of technology things that you might be wondering about as you're hearing this presentation. So I think it was uh, Tom made reference to the fact that uh, chat GPT is not available, and I think one of the other one is not available at the university. Uh, that is not an administrative decision. That is a decision that was made for us by uh, our insurance carrier. And that has happened at a number of universities. And it is an ongoing conversation between IT departments and insurance companies uh, because of cybersecurity concerns and things like that. So it's not clear when and how those things come open. You just need to know it's an ongoing conversation as to uh, even how much freedom we have as a university to decide what is available and what is not when it comes to artificial intelligence on our servers. Second thing. Uh, you need to know, if you don't know this, and most of you probably don't, we do not have a university-wide minimum technology requirement for our students. We have some programs, some, one of our graduate programs, at least one of our undergraduate programs, we do not require any student to own a laptop or to own a tablet, or to own a smartphone, even though most of them do. So as you're thinking about what you're doing in class with assessments, when you know those 13 students in front of you and they've had laptops the whole time and whatnot, that's fine, that's great. But some of you teach classes where you know that is not the case with all your students. And so just be nimble in terms of thinking through that because we don't have a minimum technology requirement, and there is no discussion about that right now. I'm not saying there won't be in the future, but there is no discussion. It's not on the table at all. Uh, that would be a dramatic change from who we've been historically uh, in our first generation population and things like that. That's a significant additional cost. And uh, even if we move in that direction, I doubt it would be a quick decision to move in that direction because there's a lot of factors that would have to go into that. So again, just be aware of the students that you're teaching and don't make assumptions uh, about what sort of access they have and don't have uh, to some of the technology uh, that other students think is perfectly natural and they use all the time. So just a couple of other items to, uh, to have in the back of your mind as you continue to process uh, that outstanding presentation that the Terminators forced them to give and uh, as well, I'm kidding, guys. And the, uh, and the stuff that we'll talk about again tomorrow. Donnie. I uh, hope that you have um, been blessed and encouraged and, and maybe, you know, hopefully we don't have too many henny pennies about the sky falling at this point. Um, especially if you grew up in the 80s like I did and watched a lot of movies about what AI will do to us. Um, but alas, have a blessed evening and we will see you tomorrow.